Good morning. Good morning. Welcome on this on this holiday weekend. Um, they say that uh, when we reach uh, Labor Day, that that's the end of summer, and and the announcements we have really show it is the end of summer for us as well. Next week, I want to um, make sure everyone knows this. Next week, we will be in the sanctuary. Um, won't be down here in Fellowship Hall until next summer. Um, there's some, also some other uh, notices in your bulletin. First of all, this Wednesday starts um, our rehearsals for choir. And it starts at 5.30 and 6.30 for bell choir and then 7.30 for vocal choir. Anyone is welcome to join. Also, this, this week on Tuesday, the U okay, the United Women in Faith starts <laughs> starts their um, fall. <laughs> the um, so on September on Tuesday at 6 30 p.m. or 6, oh, I have it here. It, it will be in your chimes. It's not in your bulletin. So I will give you some information here. Um, at 6.30, the unit meeting starts in Dessel Room. And you can join us or you can do via Zoom. The salad and dessert supper is at 6.30 to 7.15. Now the program is going to be a good one because uh, Shannon Sampson will be giving a program on her mission trip that she made to Puerto Rico in, in the spring. If you would like to come, please contact Nancy if you haven't already. Um, she will need to know, first of all, if you are going to be here in person, and second of all, if you need the Zoom link. So please see her if you haven't responded uh, to her email. Now this is not a members only event. Anyone can join us for um, the meeting. So keep that in mind. Also, I just wanted to give a heads up because I'm doing some fall clean out closets and, um, and some, some of my things that I don't need. The fall basement sale will be held here on Friday and Saturday, October 7th and 8th. So keep that in mind um, on third, the Thursday before and October 6th, uh, they will be setting up here. So uh, there'll be more information about that later on. Um, just, oh, also, as far as the, the unit meeting on Tuesday, um, if, if you can and you're able to come, please bring a salad or a dessert. That's all I, oh, the office will be closed tomorrow, too. <laughs> Reopening on Tuesday. There's a lot to get through. <laughs> I wanted to make a brief apology. You might have noticed, uh, especially to our, our online friends, um, but we started just two or three minutes later than usual. We were not on schedule because just before we got started, we lost internet. And we can't stream to our to our online without that. So, so Lynn was busy upstairs re rebooting our, uh, some things to make it work. So <clears throat> we apologize for that. Uh, I wanted to point out the second thing is if you look over on the wall, you'll see a new box bolted to the wall, courtesy of, of Mike Greiner doing the labor of bolting it to the wall. But we, the, the, our trustees have purchased and have finally accepted delivery of, uh, after supply chain problems, um, of our new AEDs, the Automatic Electronic Defibrillators. Uh, so, so we have two, one on this floor and one on the floor above. Uh, if there will be some more, uh, if some additional information forthcoming uh, about how to get training, but much of the training for those has now moved online, and we can give you a link 
uh, at some point uh, if you want to be trained on how to use them. Uh, and, and we're having a conversation about perhaps having an in-person, hands-on training event as well. But uh, they are really valuable to have those in a building. You, we pray we never need them. Uh, but if you need them, there's no substitute for having one. So. Any other announcements anyone has? Okay. Then please join me for the call to worship and stand if you're able. It's taken from Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God! How vast is the sum of them! For I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Okay, this morning, Tim. You guys hear me? Okay. This morning, Tim, just a reminder that. You know, God's not done with this yet. He's still working on us.
may you be at work in us so that we can be more like you each day and become more like the people you created us to be. Amen. I have a question. I'm looking at my bulletin. Do you have a liturgy for communion in your... Okay, you don't. Good, it's not me. <clears throat> That's okay. We'll do without. But I just wanted to make sure I hadn't lost mine. We, we pause once a month. And, and, and these, these breaks in seasons, as we say, we're, we're ending summer and beginning a new season of fall, or, or, or when we have Easter or when we have Christmas, these breaks in our seasons are a wonderful time for us to just take a deep breath and pause and, and share this time at the Lord's table and remember the story. We remember that Jesus met with his disciples. He met with his friends and the people who, who walked with him and talked with him and lived with him. And they shared a meal together. It was, it was a private thing. And yet, as it is for many of us, sharing a meal was an intimate act. What's, what's one of the things that, that only the closest people to you have, you invite them into your home to share a meal, right? It's, it draws us closer. It is an act of intimacy, if you will. And this is what they did. It, it, like Thanksgiving, the family was gathered together. And they shared this traditional meal. And there were traditional toasts and traditional speeches. And Jesus broke from tradition. He took bread, and he broke it, and he said, this, this, this is my body, broken for you. That was an odd thing to say. And the disciples, you can be sure, did not know what to make of that. This is my body, broken for you. While the trustees, not trustees, while the ushers come and, and pass out the, the elements, we're going to sing the first verse of our, our song. Any. Later in the same meal, Jesus took the cup at a time for a traditional toast and, and again broke from tradition. Rather than saying the words of the traditional toast, Jesus said, this is my blood 
the blood of a new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins for you and for many. This is my blood. My blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins for you and for many. Ready? Thank you, Patty. So how was your week? Ooh, it was busy. I, I, I told somebody this week that this, this week the reality sunk in different between, you know, theoretically I knew going back to school was gonna be hard. This week I had homework, it was hard. <laughs> uh, so how, are you, how about you? What was one thing that happened to you this week where it was an aha moment or an ooh, God did that moment? Did you have one of those this week? Um, we're going up to Geneva on the lake, and along the way there's an Amish country, and there's an Amish wedding. An Amish wedding. Beautiful. Continue as I have often encouraged you to, to be aware of the things around you. 
for those moments when, when God is exposed to us, if you will, when, when we see God at work, you know, um, when, when we see those, like perhaps run into somebody from, from high school that we thought was irredeemable, you know, I've run into a, a couple of those on the internet, Fol folks that I went to high school with that, that hung out with, with you know, well, you know, in a, when I was in school, we had the band geeks and the jocks and, and, the, and the burnouts that were outside on cigarettes and smoking dope and, you know, and, and it was a couple of the folks that, that I thought they were, they were at the far end with the burnouts and, and, the, and, and I ran into them as adults and, you know, they're in church every Sunday and they're praising God and, you know, somewhere along the line, something caught. God does stuff. And we just need to be aware because he is alive and active and involved in the lives of us, our lives and the lives of people around us. But we mostly don't notice because we aren't paying attention. Just encourage you to pay attention and see where God is working around you. And sometimes it's what's becoming the chance happening to see a wedding or a double rainbow, or sunrise, sunset. Our list, I fear, is getting longer. So maybe that's a good thing. Maybe because we are more aware of the people around us and we're sharing those. I'm hoping that's the reason and not because more people are sick. <clears throat> but keep keep this list near you this week and continue to pray for those folks. Uh, and also the, the addition for today is that Nancy Sandifer is in community care. So prayers for Nancy Sandifer as well. <clears throat> Anybody else that we need to add this morning? Okay, well, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we give thanks for all the ways that you watch over us and care for us and, and, and all the ways that you intervene for us and, and, and all the ways that you reveal yourself to us in, in our lives and in the lives of people around us. And sometimes it's something as simple as being able to, to accidentally be in the right place at the right time to see a beautiful wedding or a sunset or a rainbow, or flowers. We give thanks for the beauty that you have created in our world and with which you have surrounded us. We give thanks for, for simple creatures who, who we will never see in the depths of the ocean, but who, who breathe out the oxygen that, keep us, that keeps us alive. We give thanks for the miracle of your creation. We lift up to you all the names of those folks in our bulletin. There are many. We pray for Norma, who is our person of the week, and, and for the family of Peg Williams and the family of Jane Patterson and for the family of Les Piney. We pray you'd surround them with grace and mercy and love and hope and courage and patience and all the things that they need to, to make it through one more day and to, to adjust and adapt and to cope and to move forward. We pray for Nancy Sandifer in community care that you would pour out healing on her. And for all those folks on our list, for whatever is wrong, you know, we know why they're on the list and we pray for healing and courage and hope and, and whatever it is that they need. We pray for each and every one of us because we, we are not perfect. We did not get through the week unscathed. We carry hurts inside of us and grudges and anger and, and, and we feel the slights that people have given to us sometimes decades ago. We pray you would continue to be at work in us, shining light into dark recesses of our soul, bringing healing 
to the places where we've been hurt so that we, we might grow well, grow stronger, grow better, grow to be more and more every day like you. We give thanks, O Lord, for all these gifts and, and for this prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You want me first or you first? We gotta start the ushers doing their thing. You can start the ushers and then we'll start singing. Okay. <laughs> ushers, it's time for you to do your thing. And we're just gonna give God thanks. We give thanks, O oh Lord, for all your gifts. We, we brought gifts to you to give thanks to you, to show you our gratitude. And we pray you would bless these gifts and, and, and those who brought them. That gift and giver might be filled with your spirit, go out from this place, and be Jesus to the world. And all God's people said, Amen. I expect you to, you know, really liven it up here. We are, you guys should know most of these. Um, the last one I'm going to sing <laughs> and shout. Okay, you guys know how to do that. You guys know how to clap, right? Clap. And you know how to snap, most of you. All right. And you know how to stomp. And you can just kind of jump in your seat. <laughs> All right. So we're going to have fun with this. <laughs> what? That said, I can assure you that if we were in Liberia with our African friends, you would not stop them from jumping. <laughs>
clapping. And I clap, clap, clap. I'm gonna snap, snap, snap. Gonna clap, I'm gonna snap. Praise the Lord. When those gates are open wide, I'm gonna sit by Jesus. Gonna snap, praise the Lord. I'm gonna stomp, stomp, stomp. I'm gonna jump, jump, jump. Gonna stomp, I'm gonna jump. Thank you. Oh. Now, you notice what happened when Patty started playing the doxology and she had something wrong and what happened? She started over, right? Have you ever had a chance to have a do-over? In the 1991 movie, City Slickers, Starring Billy Crystal as Mitch, four friends decide to get away from the city. That to get away from all of their problems for a, a few weeks by going out west and joining a cattle drive. One of those four friends, Phil, has a crisis because just before leaving on their trip, he's been caught cheating on his wife. And, and he was, to his mind, about to lose everything that he valued. And so one evening, Phil breaks down in tears by the campfire. And his friend Mitch comes up behind him and he pats Phil's back and attempts to comfort him, saying, hey, Phil, come on, Philly. It's okay, man. It's, it's not that bad. To which Phil replies, my life is over. I'm almost 40 years old, and I'm at the end of my life. And he sobs. Mitch tries to get Phil's attention, and he says, Phil, hey. When Phil looks up, Mitch continues by saying, you, you remember when we were kids? And when we were playing ball, and, and somebody hit a ball over the fence out of bounds, and we all yelled, do over. Your life is a do over. You've got a clean slate. Phil's life was a do over. At 40 years old, he was going to start over and build a new life. And I'm certain that resonates with some of the people in this room and some of you online. Certainly most of us have family or friends that have lived through divorce or separation or the death of a spouse or loss of parents or unemployment or, or other situations that, that led to similar restarts or do-overs in their lives. Now, well, while naming these sorts of things a do-over might be new, the idea of starting over due to a crisis, certainly is not new. In Jeremiah chapter 18, we hear these words. 
this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. And so I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. And so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt these young men over here and ask him a question while we're in the middle of that. You guys ever work with modeling clay or Play-Doh? Does it always come out perfect? What happens when it's not perfect? Smash it flat, right? Start over. That's exactly what happens in Jeremiah's story. That's exactly what happens in Jeremiah's story. I saw him working at the wheel, but the pot that he was shaping with the clay was marred in his hands, and so the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. And the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like the clay in the hands of the potter, so are you, Israel. If at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and, and if that nation that I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict upon it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a kingdom or nation is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good that I had intended for it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. At the command of God, Jeremiah goes to the potter's house and he, and he watches as the potter spins clay on the wheel and begins to form a pot. But some imperfection marred that pot. Sometimes when you're spinning clay, especially if you have homemade clay or... or, or bargain basement clay. Sometimes a tiny pebble remains undiscovered in the clay. And as it spins on the potter's wheel, the pebble moves towards the surface. It catches on the potter's hand and carves a big groove in the clay, or maybe worse. When that happens, the potter simply declares that the pot is a do-over. He crushes it back into a shapeless lump, puts it in the middle of his wheel and starts over and begins to form something new. God says that's what he intends to do with the entire nation of, Egypt, uh, of Israel. Things are not going well. God has warned them to repent from their evil, and they have not. And so God is going to declare a do-over. He's going to allow disaster to befall them, to crush them back into a lump, start over, build something new with the lives of each person and with the nation of Israel. <clears throat> God intends to reshape his people into something new, something good, something faithful, righteous, and beautiful. Most often, you see, do-overs are avoidable. God had warned the nation of Israel more than once about the evil that they were doing, and they, 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 God had commanded them to repent. If, if they had listened to the warning of God, had listened to the warnings of God's prophets, if they had followed the commands of God that were contained in their scriptures, then the do-over and all the pain that went with it could have been avoided. That's exactly the point of the illustrations that Jesus uses in the story of Luke 14. Luke 14, 
verse 25, we hear this story. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to the crowd, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will you not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Now, I don't know about you, I grew up in Akron. In Akron, Ohio, there is a giant half-built building started by Rex Humbard, nicknamed Rex's Roundhouse. As Rex started to build a giant revolving restaurant at one of the highest hills in the city and ran out of money. It now has a cell tower in it, but other than that, still empty. 40 years later, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go out to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and continue and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is, a still, is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. The reason that Jesus' illustrations stand out in this story for us today is because of how these stories stand in contrast to what we just read in Jeremiah. When we hear Jesus say that someone should consider the cost of building a tower before they started construction, we all think, well, of course they would. And when he describes a king as considering the strength of his army in comparison to the strength of the army that's coming towards him, we think, sure, that seems natural and reasonable. But in Jeremiah, although the stakes were astronomically higher, what we saw was that no one took the time to consider the cost before they began wandering away from God. The stakes of their decision were a complete do-over a total disaster, a complete destruction and restart of their nation. But no one was interested in considering the cost or hearing God's warnings before it came time to pay the price for their decisions. And so Jesus is warning his listeners and he's warning us of that same thing. There is a cost to following Jesus. We might lose relationships with family members or relationships with friends or co-workers if we choose to follow Jesus. But at the same time, there is a cost of not following Jesus, just as there was in the time of Jeremiah. If we wanna see an example or two of what it might cost us to follow Jesus, we can find those examples in the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a man by the name of Philemon. In that letter, Paul writes to Philemon, a man uh, that he knew, a man who had come to faith through the ministry of Paul and his associates and had grown in faith by attending worship in Paul's house church. And as he writes, Paul very publicly asks Philemon to do something quite surprising. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, 
and to the church that meets in your home. Hmm. So he's talking to Philemon and to the church that meets in his home. I also, grace and peace to you. Uh, you here is plural, meaning everybody in the church. So grace and peace to y'all from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and, and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the, in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while, while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. As a quick aside, right there at the very end, it says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. It is well known and well established in other letters of Paul that Paul often did not write his letters. as He had, he had someone uh, he would dictate, someone else would write. And so we can imagine that these words, and Paul's eyesight at this point being in prison was, was said to be not very good. So we can imagine that if we had the original letter in our hand, this last part would be in a different script, written in a different handwriting, perhaps larger because his eyesight was, was failing. And he, he, took his, he took the pen to his own hand and he says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. So he knew that these were Paul's words and not those of someone else. As you may have surmised, Onesimus was a slave that belonged to Philemon. Philemon's the guy that Paul's writing to in this letter. But for whatever reasons, he was not a good and obedient slave, and he eventually ran away from Philemon. And while Onesimus was on the run, he encountered Paul and began to voluntarily work with rather than serve, work with Paul and his team. Now, we don't know whether Paul and Onesimus knew one another from the same time that Paul knew uh, Philemon, quite possibly. They met at church, but we don't know. We know that Onesimus' character changed because of the time that he spent working alongside Paul, studying the scriptures, and ministering to others with Paul and his team. 
In time, Onesimus was convicted by God to return to his master regardless of the consequences. And so, so Paul writes to Philemon very publicly. He writes to the whole church alongside of Philemon and, and asks Philemon to do the right thing. For Onesimus, honoring God and honoring the, the, the law of Rome meant returning to his master and risking that Philemon would treat him fairly, risking that, he, that Philemon would listen to Paul and take Paul's advice. Um, the risk that he took in doing so was that his master would be angry, could treat him harshly, beat him, possibly even kill him. And for Philemon, honoring God and, and honoring his mentor and pastor Paul, meant at the very least losing money, risking the condemnation of his peers and, and risking the condemnation of his community for freeing his misbehaving, law-breaking slave. The, the Roman world ran on a culture of law and honor and patronage. Philemon would understandably lose the money he invested when he purchased Onesimus, but in addition to that, while freeing a slave was certainly legal and not at all uncommon, his peers may not have appreciated the example and the precedent that Philemon would be setting. And their displeasure, as well as the potential displeasure of Philemon's patrons, might have cost him a great deal of money and business. Both Onesimus and Philemon had a chance at a do-over. They both had a chance to start their relationship with one another over again. But starting over carried risks and rewards for both men. The risks we already mentioned, but the rewards were that their their new relationship outside of slavery would be more amicable, more brotherly, less hostile, more productive, more profitable, and, and most importantly, closer to the will of God. There is a cost to following Jesus, but there is also a cost to not following Jesus, is it time for a do-over in your life that will bring you closer to God? There will undoubtedly be costs that must be considered. But as we saw, as we saw in the story of Israel that we read in Jeremiah, the danger of not starting over is that sometimes... God will do it for you. Let's stand and just sing to God how great he is.
Many of us have been forced into places in life where we had to do over. We lost jobs, we lost spouses, we all kinds of stuff happens, make us do over. And you know, whenever that happens, one thing that's always certain is that God is there. God is there with his arms open wide to take us in and give us what we need. Sometimes the do-over is something that needs to happen because our hearts have walked away from God, unrelated to the physical challenges of just getting through this life. We've wandered away. There's a price to be paid for finding our way back, and God's arms are open wide to take us back. But part of the reminder is, If we fail to come back to the arms of God, God might just start a do-over for us without our choice. Always less painful for us to find our way back to God on our own. His arms are always open to welcome us home. Have a great week, everybody.